Well, I started out in life as a garden variety gastroenterologist, uh, fully expecting that my career would involve putting endoscopes into people and looking around inside. But I quickly learned that about a third of my patients had physical symptoms not related to anything that I could see with diagnostic tests, but instead connected to stress. And that if I was able to uncover what the stress was, and it wasn't always obvious uh, what it was, uh, but if I could find it, we could almost always treat it successfully. And then the symptoms would come down and in some cases go away completely. Uh, and in a few other cases, go away completely in a very short space of time. So that became, uh, instead of one of the more frustrating aspects of practice, which it is for many physicians, it became one of the most rewarding. And I did that for, uh, from 1984 onwards, over 7,000 patients uh, with those problems. Well, these were patients who had no organ disease or structural abnormality that could account for their symptoms, but I could tell that it was a stress-related illness by uncovering what the stress was, treating that, and then seeing that patients got better. That was the confirmation that I was on the right track, and it took me hundreds of interviews every year for four or five years before my learning curve finally reached a, a decent level, and then another decade after that, of experience before I felt ready to actually write a book about it that would be meaningful and useful to patients. And it took me three years to write it. I kept editing it over and over again to try to make it as clear as possible, put it in, in simple, uh, straightforward language um, that people could connect with, that uh, there are a lot of case histories in it that are drawn from the full spectrum of different kinds of stresses that can make people physically ill with the idea that one or more of those stories would resonate for a reader uh, in a way that would give them insight into their own personal situation. And it's been very popular. Once it came out, I started getting invitations to speak all over North America and Europe, um, over a hundred television and radio broadcast interviews, teaching in two or three different graduate schools. Um, the interest in this has just exploded, which is wonderful to see because it's been a huge blind spot uh, for the healthcare profession. Uh, for centuries. One of the reasons why I pursued work in this field was that to me this is a justice issue. That a human being um, who is suffering should be able to get appropriate diagnosis and relief of their symptoms if it's possible from the healthcare system no matter what is causing their illness. If it's a structural abnormality or an organ disease, the system is very good at helping people with that problem. If their exact same symptom is caused by stress or by repressed emotions or by uh, low self-esteem or by poor self-care skills, uh, the system typically um, flails at that or is ignorant of what to do or simply places those patients outside of its job description. And for me, that is totally unjust. If, if you are suff two people are suffering the same symptom, um, they should be able to receive the same quality of care. almost everybody has had the experience of stress-related symptoms at one time or another. Anybody who's ever blushed with embarrassment, anybody who's ever felt a knot in their abdomen when they're in a tense situation, that's what we call a psychophysiologic reaction, a mind-to-body um, reaction that produces real uh, physical symptoms. They're not imaginary, they're not quote-unquote in your head, they're real. And if the level of stress is, is high enough or goes on for a long enough period of time, um, that can turn into uh, what, for all intents and purposes, is an illness. Uh, it can cause back pain, it can cause ringing in the ears, it can cause any kind of gastrointestinal symptom, uh, any pain in almost any location in the body, uh, typically multiple symptoms in many people, more than one location at a time, uh, but they're all real. Um, and they afflict uh, one in six adults and one in three of everybody who goes to see their doctor for an evaluation. So these are very, very common. 
uh, can be very, very severe. Many of my patients have been hospitalized for this. It, it reached that level. Uh, it can go on for decades. My, my personal record patient uh, was ill for 79 years. Um, my personal record patient for uh, hospitalization was uh, 11 straight weeks. And when I was asked to see her, it was you know, near the end of that time, and she was getting enormous doses of morphine around the clock uh, for her symptoms. So the, the severity can absolutely equal what you find from organ disease and structural abnormalities. And the number of symptoms <clears throat> typically exceeds what you get uh, from uh, organ disease or structural abnormalities. My personal record patient there uh, came to me with a printout from the internet on which he had circled 27 different symptoms that he personally was suffering from. And yet all 27 were relieved in about a month in his case. So the, um, in spite of the severity, the outcomes, uh, if you know what to look for, can be very, very good uh, with this form of illness. Yeah, absolutely. Um, many of my patients have been ill uh, for more than 10 years. Uh, the very first patient in my book had uh, severe attacks that put her in the hospital four times a year uh, for 15 years. And yet, uh, in her case, and this is a little unusual, but she was cured in a one-hour conversation. So it, just by, in her case, getting the insight uh, about where those symptoms were coming from, uh, seeing the connection to a particular severe stress in her life, uh, bringing that into conscious awareness. Uh, in her case, that was all that was necessary. She called me up a year later to say that she'd gone an entire year uh, with no symptoms, and she'd previously had six or 10 uh, severe attacks uh, uh, in a 12-month period of time. So yeah, absolutely, uh, those can improve. And there is a very wide range of um, speed with which people recover. You know, the patient that I mentioned earlier who was essentially well in an hour and <clears throat> on the other end of the, the spectrum, I found out about one of uh, my patients who went off to therapy with some very good ideas about what to work on. But even after 20 years of mostly going to therapy on a regular basis, she still had symptoms. She, wasn't taking narcotics anymore, she wasn't being hospitalized anymore, but she was still having symptoms. So there is a wide spectrum. And your question is what accounts for that? And it has to do with the severity of the stress that they were uh, subject to, uh, what age um, the stresses occurred. You know, we're more vulnerable when we're very young. Was there any um, offsetting support that the person received when they were experiencing the, the stress, particularly uh, as a child. Um, their own resilience qualities, and you know, there are a number of elements that go into that, but um, people differ with respect to how resilient they are in coping with stress. People's ability to be in touch with um, their emotional reaction. Much of stress-related illness is linked to repressed emotions. And how easy is it for you then to get into contact with those emotions, to recognize that those emotions are there, to bring them into conscious awareness? Um, that's a skill that differs uh, a lot from person to person. But even the people who are going to take a very long time to make a full recovery, um, they can tell that they're on the pathway. They can tell that they are moving in the right direction. Often it's been a long road for them just to find out what they need to do to get better. But once they do find that out, once they do recognize that they're on the correct pathway, the, the anxiety, the fear that, that people are losing their minds uh, about these, this symptom, uh, that tends to go away and, and they can see that there's a, um, a way to move forward. And that makes a huge difference. It's an important question about and there's, there's controversy about this in the field. Do people need to fully embrace the idea that they have a mind-body condition or a stress-related illness in order to make any progress at all? And my own take on this is that it's not necessary <clears throat> to uh, draw a firm conclusion about that. It's perfectly okay to wonder uh, if you've got 
a possibility of an organ disease or a structural abnormality. And if you're worried about that, continue to work with your medical clinicians uh, to exclude those possibilities um, whenever they come up. But at the same time, um, the more tests that you've had done, the less likely it is that there's an organ disease and a structural abnormality. And that makes the stress connection um, more likely. And so you shouldn't ignore that. You should work on those issues, try to uncover the underlying stresses, try to reduce the ones that you uncover, and see if you get better. If you find that your symptoms are making progress, that's going to give you increasing confidence that the stress connection pathway is the one to pursue. But anytime you have a flare-up and it's perfectly normal in recovering from this illness for there to be ups and downs in your symptoms, for the symptoms to move to different places in the body or to mutate into something um, uh, else like insomnia, for example. Uh, and if you have worries when that happens, by all means, go back to your medical clinician and get it evaluated. But in the meantime, don't neglect uh, working on the stress. Don't neglect working on um, the issues that you've uncovered. Uh, to keep moving forward. Two steps forward, one step back is a very common pathway for people who are recovering. The second thing that, that I would do uh, to help you with um, this concern is to look at the, uh, the list of questions that we've placed on the ppdassociation.org website. <clears throat> at the moment, there's about 30 of them. We might um, increase that in the future, but these are questions that help establish whether your illness is occurring in the context that we find for many patients with psychophysiologic disorders or mind-body disorders. It asks you about a whole lot of different aspects of your symptoms and of your life uh, to see are you fitting into this pattern? Are you uh, sharing characteristics with other people who have been down this road? And the more of those questions uh, to which you answer a yes or in the affirmative, the more likely it is that your underlying symptoms are linked to stress. A patient who has found their way to uh, understanding mind-body or stress-related illness and who is working on the issues and is not making good progress, and, and that's certainly not an unusual uh, phenomenon and oftentimes means that uh, they simply haven't found um, the uh, underlying stresses or connected with the repressed emotions um, to the degree that is needed and it, that's a struggle. Many patients with this form of illness were placed under stress or adversity at a very early age in their life and they got very skilled at repressing those emotions um, and oftentimes the, the adversity was inflicted on them by people that they still care about which is still another reason why those emotions may be uh, kept in the background or that they want to have uh, reestablish a, a positive relationship with and to have those emotions come into conscious awareness might interfere uh, with any uh, hope for reconciliation with that person. So a lot of good reasons to keep the uh, emotions that are causing these problems uh, in the background. And, and connecting with them uh, is difficult. So recommendations there if you can uh, work with a therapist um, who's got uh, experience with this. Many mental health professionals are not so experienced with the kinds of issues that occur in people who are physically ill. Uh, but if you can find one who's got that experience, that can help. Um, the smartphone computer application called Curable will often help people connect with these. Um, there are numerous good books to read on this subject and they're all different. So if you've read one or two of them, uh, reading uh, a third or a fourth uh, might give you insight that you haven't had up to now. So these are some of the techniques um, that might help you break through to an understanding of the underlying causes. One of the best places to find a practitioner <clears throat> is in the directory on the ppdassociation.org website. We are um, listing the contact information for people that 
uh, we feel have experience and interest uh, in this area enough to um, help uh, patients with their issues. So that's the first place I would go. Doctors have rarely had any formal training in how to diagnose and treat psychophysiologic disorders. Um, the medical profession has tended to fracture itself into the mental health world and what we might call the medical world or the, the structural organ uh, world. And there's very little overlap um, between those two areas. So both groups typically have not had formal training in how to evaluate uh, a psychophysiologic disorder. The mental health people tend not to have experience with folks who are physically suffering, uh, having a, a physical symptom of some kind, chronic pain or otherwise. The organ and structural doctors have typically not had training in how to assess someone for uh, the psychological and stress-related causes of physical symptoms. And so patients with th these real physical symptoms caused by a psychological or stress cause fall right in the middle of those two groups, which in, into essentially a giant blind spot uh, in the healthcare system. And what we're trying to do in the, the PPDA is educate both sides that they need to, to have a meeting of the minds. They need to be uh, understanding the, the power of stress and the mind and psychology at causing real physical pain or other symptoms so that the medical clinicians can include this in their thinking uh, when they evaluate patients and the mental health professionals can know the more exactly the kinds of issues they should be looking for um, in someone who's physically ill, which is something of a parallel universe to what they typically do day to day in evaluating people with mental health concerns. Um, it's a different set of issues that they should be looking for in someone who's physically ill than in someone who has primarily a mental health complaint. So a little bit more overlap uh, between these two groups and we'll see vastly better outcomes uh, for people with PPD. The question has to do with the scientific support uh, for this approach and how does that compare with the scientific support for alternative health care. And there was a researcher in England who devoted his career to studying alternative health methods, uh, including acupuncture and Reiki and a number of others, and found that in 95% of those techniques, the benefit was as much as placebo, which is, you know, not zero. I mean, there was, there was benefit, but it wasn't better um, than a placebo. On the contrary, with uh, mind-body techniques and with psychophysiologic approaches, there is a growing body of evidence uh, published in reputable journals um, that scientifically supports um, these ideas. That number one, a psychological approach to physical symptoms can have benefit. And there are a number of different psychological approaches that have been tried. Um, most of them tend to have uh, modest benefits, but a couple of them um, that we call pain reprocessing therapy and uh, emotional awareness and expression therapy. Those two have risen above uh, the others and have shown more powerful uh, benefits uh, in this area. We've also found from functional MRI studies that people with psychophysiologic disorders are actually have their brains wired in different ways uh, than people without these symptoms. That when you inflict pain on someone, you know, put a blood pressure cuff on them, put something that's hot on their arm, and see what parts of their brain light up, people with these uh, psychophysiologic conditions, their brains are literally wired differently uh, in response to those stimuli <clears throat> than people that don't have these conditions. So there's a, a real physiologic underpinning uh, to this uh, that's been found. And there's even now a case study that shows that that wiring can go back to a healthy pattern uh, with psychotherapy. And 
further evidence that if you've been through traumas, if you've been through adverse childhood experiences, that can impact the wiring of your brain in ways that are uh, exactly what we're seeing in psychophysiologic disorders. So there's a, a, a huge difference between the scientific support, uh, and we've got this in a uh, indexed and annotated bibliography uh, on the PPD Association website, a huge difference between that scientific support for what we do and the scientific support for other forms of treatment. So the question is, what should someone be doing um, with this condition? Should they be um, trying every conceivable alternative form of health care uh, that's out there? And you know, my answer is no, uh, because most of those other forms of treatment that you'll find um, are just treating the symptoms. They're not treating the underlying cause. The underlying cause is one or more forms of stress and it's essential to go through those one by one and see if you're suffering from them. And the most uh, challenging to uncover oftentimes is stress that a person experienced when they were growing up, what's called an adverse childhood experience or ACE. And oftentimes when people look back, uh, since they don't have a parallel life to compare, when they look back they don't necessarily recognize just how challenging their early environment was for them. So one way to help you with that is to imagine your own child or a child that you care about growing up exactly as you did and having to watch them uh, try to cope with that environment <clears throat> uh, from, from afar or, or as if you were a butterfly on the wall of your childhood home watching a kid that you care about try to cope with everything that you coped with. And how would that be for you? What kinds of emotions um, might spring up as you watch that happen. That's a great way, a great technique uh, to connect with some of the emotions that you may have experienced when you were growing up and now no longer recognize that they're still there, they're still active, they're just expressing themselves via your body. And, and when you do this, you're connecting with the real cause of the symptoms. You're not just treating the surface manifestations, you're not just trying to treat the symptoms, you're going after um, the real root source of, uh, of what's going on. And when you do that, you're more likely to see progress than you are um, with the other techniques that you know, may have some placebo benefit in this condition, uh, but nothing more than that. There are probably at least 15 different terms that cover this condition in one way or another. And part of the reason for that is that we haven't completely solved the physiology of what creates the uh, symptoms in this condition. When we, um, as a board of directors of the Psychophysiologic Disorders Association, got together in 2010 and tried to decide what we should call this. We like the term psychophysiologic because it emphasizes that there's a connection between the psyche, uh, which is the mind, um, and the body by means of physiology. In other words, that there isn't any magic about this condition, that it is just as connected to the way the body works as organ diseases or structural abnormalities. So we felt like that was the best term, especially for communicating with physicians. But uh, for other audiences, um, it's not as good, and that centers around uh, the psycho part, which in the general public, when they see the word psycho, they immediately think of the Alfred Hitchcock movie uh, or somebody who's hallucinating, and that is not what the term means at all. That, that refers to psychotic, uh, which is completely different than what we mean, which is simply the psyche uh, or the mind. So we think it's the best term. Um, but we use stress illness or mind-body condition uh, when we're speaking to the public when we don't have time to explain um, how we're using the psycho part. As the science evolves, um, we will probably get to um, more exact terms. Um, the, the, the terminology may evolve uh, even further. 
Uh, it's only recently, for example, that we've had functional MRI machines that can show what's happening in the brain uh, in people who are suffering from this condition. Uh, we know that there are different nerve pathways in the brain, so some people have started referring to this as central pain, pain that originates uh, uh, in the brain as opposed to peripheral pain, uh, pain that originates in, in a damaged part of the body, uh, for example. So that's, that's a term that's uh, coming up more and more now uh, in response to the evolution of the science. And science always is evolving, so we anticipate that our understanding of the exact physiology behind this condition will continue to grow and as it does the, the terminology uh, may also evolve along with that. So these things just take time? Uh, absolutely. It, it wasn't that long ago that congestive heart failure was referred to as the dropsy <clears throat> and you know nobody uses that term anymore but the dropsy referred to the fact that people would develop swelling in their legs as if something had dropped into their legs and what had dropped into their legs was fluid that the heart wasn't able to pump around the circulation because the heart was failing and eventually it was figured out that yeah it's the heart that is you know as the science evolved that it's the heart that was uh, the source of this problem and so the term dropsy was dropped and we started talking in terms of um, heart failure or congestive heart failure just an example of how the terminology uh, changed along with the scientific understanding. Why not keep a, a term that was around since the 1970s, tension myoneural syndrome? Well, um, it's the same reason why we uh, no longer use dropsy. Uh, the science is, has improved uh, since then and we know that uh, originally the term was tension myositis syndrome and myositis means muscle inflammation and when we found out that there isn't any muscle inflammation that was changed to myoneural and then we've since learned that uh, the importance of the brain and the mind uh, in this condition and we want to emphasize that in the new terminology and that tension isn't always in involved. Tension can also refer to um, a psychological tension or to muscle tension so there was confusion uh, around the exact meaning of that so the, the terminology has involved, evolved uh, in parallel with the science um, and that's, that's the, those are the biggest reasons why we don't use that term anymore. The PPDA or the Psychophysiologic Disorders Association was founded in 2011 by a group of very diverse professional practitioners who had started out in life in completely different areas of medicine and mental health but we all found our way to this condition of physical symptoms that are real and not connected with a structural abnormality or, or body damage or an organ disease and we just found each other uh, answering each other's questions uh, in identical ways and just had a, a meeting of the minds and we knew that we had to create a nonprofit that could serve as a vehicle to educate the public, educate medical professionals, educate mental health professionals because almost nobody uh, has had any formal training in how to diagnose and treat this condition despite the fact that the number of people who have it is 60 percent bigger than the diabetic population for example so it's it's millions of people who are falling into what is essentially the largest blind spot in the healthcare system and that that is uh, an injustice frankly and we felt that we needed to do everything we could uh, to reverse that and that's the mission of the PPDA, is primarily uh, education, but we also uh, support uh, uh, documentary films, we support uh, randomized control trials, we support uh, educational conferences, um, and uh, every year that goes by we get, we get bigger and we're able to do more. Um, and we look forward to the day when uh, treatment of this condition will be as routine as um, management of anything else. The ppdassociation.org website has an abundance of resources and they're growing all the time. Um, we have um, the context questionnaire that can help people assess themselves, their own symptoms and their, their 
general life context to see if they fit in with other patients who have had stress-related illness. So that's, that's a great place to start if you've got the very common question of could my personal symptoms fall into this mind-body stress-related uh, category. Uh, we have uh, videos and we're going to be adding to those all the time. Uh, we have a, um, a letter that you can give to your loved ones to explain uh, this form of illness to them because that's often a challenge for people. We have another document that you can give to your physician if you find that you're making progress in this area because most physicians have not had formal training in this condition and uh, it's very helpful to them to know that you've made progress with a particular form of treatment that they can then um, recommend to their other patients because every physician is going to see several patients every day uh, that suffer from these illnesses. So we're, we're adding resources um, uh, around this illness to the website all the time so it's worth coming back uh, every so often to check up on what we've been doing. Chronic pain is clearly a you know, hundreds of billions of dollars issue in the United States alone. And many patients with chronic pain have a significant psychosocial stress component uh, to their symptoms and to their disability as well that typically is not being addressed because again, we have this problem that few medical clinicians have had formal training in the kinds of uh, psychosocial assessments that are needed to uncover those issues and few mental health professionals uh, have had formal training in what to look for in people who are physically suffering. So what we offer from the PPDA is how to look specifically for the kinds of psychosocial problems that are particularly common in the chronic pain population and it turns out when those are addressed the symptoms start to improve. And when they do that, then you've offered that patient an alternative uh, to their opioids. Um, and you're gonna be able to taper those opioids much more effectively. If you just try to taper the opioids without giving the patient anything else, uh, it's going to be a struggle. And, and every physician who's worked in this field, myself included, knows that struggle, how hard it is to persuade somebody to bring their opioid dose down without doing anything else for them. Um, but what we offer in the PPDA is a range of techniques that do offer something as a replacement, something else um, that patients can use effectively uh, while their opioids are being tapered. And when we can do that, uh, their risk of dying is obviously vastly reduced, the cost of the medication is, is reduced, um, and their outcomes and their disability levels uh, are vastly improved. The greatest thing about the PPD Association or the PPDA is the collection of, of doctors and mental health professionals um, that make up our supporting board. The uh, level of experience uh, in this group uh, is each of them has decades of working in this field. Uh, and each of them brings their own personal perspective, their training background, their patient experience uh, to the table and enables us to combine all of that uh, in a way that provides the best possible um, techniques for assessing and treating patients. There isn't any other group that I know of uh, that brings this level of uh, background uh, into a combined approach uh, there's, there's really nothing else out there that uh, can come close. The membership of the PPDA is national in scope. We have experienced people from everywhere, from Los Angeles to Boston and many places in between. But we bring in uh, contacts from other English-speaking countries around the world uh, to give us support, to give us new ideas, um, and to interact with them on a regular basis. So we have a global reach, um, and, and practitioners that, that work with us uh, are also distributed globally. Uh, we, are, we are looking to build a community of people who are experienced in this field uh, from around the world 
uh, so that we have the best possible techniques for improving outcomes. One of the great things that the PPDA is able to do is by, and we've seen it um, in the group that was trained in these methods uh, in the Albany, New York area, is that patients who present themselves to the system with a psychophysiologic disorder, uh, instead of being placed in a blind spot, now their needs are met. Their underlying diagnosis is uncovered. Um, the problems that they're suffering from that are creating their symptoms can be addressed. So instead of getting essentially no care um, that's aimed at their underlying problem, they're getting appropriate care, effective care, care that changes their outcomes. So it's, it's a night and day difference um, for these patients. And the, the outcomes that you see are, are just as rewarding as you can imagine for everybody concerned. You know, probably the biggest single barrier is that we're asking people to learn a new technique. Um, and, in, you know, it, it may take uh, a day's worth of seminars for people to become comfortable with this and confident in using it in their daily practice. So that's a barrier, you know, that spending a day um, learning new ideas and then being uncomfortable at first and maybe taking a little bit more time at first uh, in your practice to use them. Uh, but in a very short space of time, you're going to be comfortable with these and be able to use them uh, the same way you do any other technique that you learned um, in medical school. So I think that's the biggest barrier is just accepting that a new technique needs to be learned. Uh, somewhat like a general surgeon going from open techniques of, of surgery to laparoscopic uh, techniques of surgery. It's, it's a, a learning curve. Um, but once people get um, past the idea that, uh, uh, that there's, there's that barrier there, uh, the job satisfaction, <clears throat> the clinical outcomes, the reward from using these techniques uh, and seeing patients improve that formerly were a, a huge source of frustration um, once people see that, they will never go back to the way that they used to practice. There are lots of people out there who can apply a particular medical technique but may not necessarily be able to teach it. But the group that came together to form the PPDA loves to teach. Um, they, they put on conferences, we put on conferences, we teach in graduate schools, um, we do webinars, we go all over North America and Europe uh, uh, teaching these techniques. And people go home from our conferences and they can apply them confidently because there's, there's not a huge amount of magic uh, around this. It's something that almost any healthcare professional, either medical or mental health, can graft onto their um, existing skills and begin using them right away uh, in their daily practice. Um, and we've got, um, again, years and years of experience. I personally have been teaching this uh, since the 1980s um, to medicine residents and um, physician assistants and nurse practitioners and physicians, uh, primary care, gynecology, general surgery, even I've taught hospital chaplains, I've taught radiologists. I mean, they, they all can um, learn these ideas and, and use them. So uh, we've got a unique capability here uh, to communicate um, our decades of experience in a relatively short space of time. The PPDA deserves support because it has brought together uh, the most experienced clinicians and practitioners from across the United States and in many cases uh, around the world uh, to develop uh, resources for patients, for medical clinicians, for mental health professionals, um, that will elevate the level and quality of care in this field um, better than anyone else out there. And the more support that we get, the um, greater our reach can be. Donations to the PPDA 
are intended to improve our ability to communicate with medical and mental health professionals and health insurers um, to make a difference uh, in the United States and around the world in the quality of care and the outcomes of people who are suffering from this condition. Remember that we're talking about one in six adults suffering from psychophysiologic disorders with neither medical clinicians nor mental health professionals typically having any formal training in how to diagnose or treat this condition. Imagine if no one knew how to diagnose or treat diabetes. What a, what a travesty um, that would be for patients and for the healthcare system and for costs. And we're talking about a population of patients that's 60 percent larger than the diabetic population. So providing support to the PPDA enables us to get our message out, our training out, just the, the basic idea that stress is capable of causing real physical symptoms. Even that simple concept um, has not been um, addressed typically by the healthcare system. That needs to change. The PPDA um, will stop at nothing to educate uh, medical professionals and the public about this condition because it's, it's not complicated, uh, but it is profoundly impactful. So we uh, have financially supported a randomized controlled trial of the methods that we teach uh, in a population of back pain patients. We're very excited about the outcome of that study, uh, which included uh, functional magnetic resonance imaging of the brain in people who are suffering back pain. Uh, so that's going on. There are two, do two documentary films in addition to one that's already been released, but two more documentary films that are in production that we're very excited about that illustrate these methods, one of which is about the randomized control trial. We have a, a multi-author international textbook in the works that's bringing together uh, expertise from around the English-speaking world uh, to uh, educate people who are new. I would have loved to have that textbook uh, when I was starting out in this field, so I wouldn't have had to uh, climb that four or five year learning curve uh, that, that caused you know, so much pain back in the, the 1980s for me. Um, we've got um, YouTube videos that are uh, for, for training and for public education coming out all the time. Um, so lots and lots going on, uh, and with support, we can do even more. Anyone who supports the PPDA immediately joins the team that is trying to effect this transformation. I mean, again, this, this is the biggest blind spot in the healthcare system. This is the single largest source of unnecessary human suffering that I know of. And people who support us are giving their support to the most experienced clinicians, the best teachers, um, and putting their dollars uh, behind um, education in a variety of forms um, that's going to make uh, a huge difference in closing this blind spot. All of us who work in the PPDA have seen uh, in our own practices the absolute transformation of patients' lives. We not only relieve their symptoms, but we help them uh, uh, personally in their lives as well. The, the two areas of improvement uh, go hand in hand with each other. So the transformation of people's symptoms and their lives is, is absolutely possible. We see it in our practices on a daily basis. And the more support that we get, the more we can bring these kinds of outcomes um, to everybody. And it, it's going to make a, a huge difference. So we'd, we'd love to have people join us in doing that.